Welcome to lecture eight. In this lecture, we will uh, learn how to write a function as a sum, infinite sum of elementary functions. We will see that this will uh, give us some beautiful formulas for uh, sum, the sum of the inverse of the squares of natural numbers. In the next lecture, we will address a similar problem, but instead of writing a function as an infinite sum, we will see how we can write it as an infinite product of elementary function. What are the functions we are considering here? These are so-called meromorphic functions. This is a just a concise name to mean a function. Let's call it F. And we say that it's meromorphic on U, which is an open set. If F is holomorphic on U, except at some points where it has a pole singularities. And obviously here we also assume that uh, the pole can also be a uh, removable singularity maybe. This is some, in some sense a trivial case. So either a pole or a removable singularity. So surely we don't want essential singularities. What are examples of meromorphic functions? So one example um, appeared already in the lecture. So if you have two holomorphic functions and we assume that H is not identically zero, then I can take the quotient G over H and this is a meromorphic function on U. Now we saw in the exercise how uh, you can compute the order of the pole in terms of what you know about G and H. Another important way to build a meromorphic function starting from known meromorphic function is just taking the sum. So if you have G1 to Gn meromorphic on U, then the sum G1 plus Gn will also be meromorphic on you. And the, pole, the poles of this sum will be um, contained in the set of poles of this, the union of the set of poles of the singular, func of the singular functions. And, um, but it may be that when you take the sum, some of these uh, poles becomes removable, remo removable singularities because some, um, for example, some of the GIs have the same principal part at a common pole. So this is a, a very uh, natural way to, to build the function, just taking the sum. And the problem we want to address here is what happens when we take an infinite sum of meromorphic functions. So let's suppose that Gn is a sequence of meromorphic functions on some open set U. The question we want to address is when is the infinite sum or n going from zero to infinity of Gn also meromorphic on U? Now, if, it, if it is meromorphic, then we also maybe want to uh, see what the um, derivative of this meromorphic function is in terms of the derivatives of Gn. In order to keep a condition about the meromorphicity of the infinite sum, we need an important definition. So let's take a, a sequence of meromorphic functions. Then uh, this is said to converge uniformly on compact sets. If for all k in U compact, 
we can find some n0 natural number. And this n0 obviously will depend on k, depending on k, with the property that for all n bigger than this n0, gn has no pole on k. And if I now define f tilde m, the function which is the sum from n0 to some m bigger than n0 of the gn, then I want this sequence to converge uniformly on k. So this one, I want this sequence, I want to converge uniformly on k, and then it will converge uh, to some function f tilde, which you can write uh, as uh, the infinite sum from n0 to infinity of the gn. Okay, so the idea is that I can always, for every compact set, I always, I always found this number n0, so that removing the function from n equal to zero to n zero minus one, all the other functions have no pole on K. So these are holomorphic functions. In particular, it makes sense um, to um, ask if they converge uniformly to K. So if you have some poles on K, then uh, you cannot expect this to converge uniform because at the pole, the function will blow up to infinity. So first we remove some of all the rest will converge uniformly. So in, the, uh, in what follows, I will also use uh, uh, some uh, abbreviation. Instead of, instead of saying converge uniformly on compact sets, I will just say converge UCS. Now this stays for uniformly on compact sets. Okay, so now with this definition, we can formulate uh, the theorem we want. Uh, is that this uh, convergence uh, uniform on compact sets is enough to have that the infinite sum is uh, meromorphic. So if gn uh, is a sequence of meromorphic functions on, on u, and we suppose that this sequence converges uniformly on compact sets, then the function f, which is the infinite sum, going from zero to infinity of gn, is also meromorphic on u. And moreover, the derivative f prime is just the infinite sum of the derivatives. And you can also say something about the poles. Moreover, the poles, the set of poles of F is contained in, in the union of the set of poles for the GN and actually with equality, with equality between these two sets if um, the uh, function GN have this joint set of poles. So if the functions gn have this joint set um, of poles. So if I give you two functions from this sequence, this set of poles um, of these two functions will be these joint sets. This in particular means, let me recall this here, that if all gn are holomorphic, then also f has no pole, and therefore is also f holomorphic. So if all gn are holomorphic, then also f is holomorphic in, obviously, in uh, u. Okay, so this is the theorem we want to prove. It's an important result. To prove this theorem, we need a small uh, lemma that we state now. 
what does the lemma say? The lemma says that if you take V in, in C, which is an open set, and we consider of tilde M a sequence of holomorphic functions, so M now goes from zero to infinity. These are holomorphic and they converge to some function f tilde uniformly on V. Then the function f tilde is holomorphic and the derivatives of the functions f tilde m converges to the derivative of f tilde uniformly on every disk d s z1 contained in v so in all closed disk contained in uh, in v of the derivative it will not be in general uniform on the whole uh, v but for every disk which is contained in V, this will be uh, the case. And we will see in, in short, uh, shortly why uh, this is true. Okay, let us prove the lemma. So proof of lemma. So the proof of the lemma is a consequence of uh, uh, Morera's and uh, uh, Cauchy theorem. So if we use both Morera and Cauchy, then what we have is um, that if G is a function which is holomorphic, then this implies that for all triangles in V, the integral of G over the triangle is zero and vice versa. Okay, so if you have a function, continuous function, which is, um, which have a vanishing integral on all the triangles, then um, this function is actually uh, holomorphic. And this is the content of um, uh, Morera's, uh, Morera's theorem. Okay, very good. So now using this, uh, how can we prove uh, the lemma? So we want to show that F tilde is holomorphic. So uh, for doing this, it's enough to compute the integral of F tilde on a, a triangle. No, we're, we're, we're now this is a triangle in V. And we know now that since the convergence is uniform, this is the limit as m goes to infinity of the integral over the triangle of, of the function f tilde m. However, we know that these functions are holomorphic. So this means that this integral is zero for every m. Therefore, also the limit vanishes. So we see here that F tilde is holomorphic. Since the triangle was uh, taken uh, arbitrary. Now let, let's show the convergence of the derivative. So take now a disk such that the closure of the disk is in V and choose S prime bigger than S, such that also the slightly bigger disk with radius S prime is contained in V. Okay, so let, let's draw uh, a picture here. So if V is given here, so this is my V, then uh, I have my 
my disk here. So this is Z1 and then I have my disk here around. This is of radius, um, radius S. And then I also consider a slightly bigger disk, which is still contained. And this is of radius S prime, which is still contained in, uh, in V. Now we want to show the convergence of the derivatives inside the uh, smaller, uh, inside the smaller disk. So we want to show the convergence here inside this disk. So let's take a Z here. So if Z now belongs to the smaller disk, what we can do, we can apply the uh, Cauchy formula. So we can say that the, um, the difference between the derivative of Z and the derivative of uh, Z at, uh, of the function F tilde M, this is equal to one over two pi I. And then the integral over the circle of that one and radius S prime of uh, F tilde W minus F tilde M W divided by W minus Z squared. So this is, as to say here, this is Cauchy formula for the derivative of F tilde minus F tilde M. Very good. So we have this formula, then we can use this formula to um, est estimate the difference in the derivative. So this implies that F tilde prime Z minus F tilde M prime Z, this is less or equal than one over two pi. Then we have the length, the length of uh, um, the circle, the length is two pi times S prime. And then we have the maximum of the, uh, of the norm of the function we are integrating. So the function we are integrating is um, F tilde omega uh, minus F tilde M W over W minus Z squared. And this we are taking the uh, the maximum for all W in the circle. Very good. So how can we can estimate this? So the denominator is easy to estimate because uh, w is a point on the boundary of the disk, the bigger disk, Z is inside the smaller disk. So um, this difference will have norm which is bigger than S prime minus S. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, norm which is um, bigger than S prime minus S. So we get here S prime minus S at the denominator. And we can um, majorize the, the maximum by taking the maximum over the whole V. Okay, and now we know that the convergence is uniform. So this last part, this last part here is converging, is converging to zero. So this goes to zero as M goes to infinity. And we see that, okay, we have this constant S prime divided by S prime minus S, but it's just a constant and then everything goes to, goes to zero. And so we see that the convergence uh, of F uh, tilde prime M to F tilde prime is uniform in this disk. So this finishes the proof. Very good. So this gives us a very important uh, tool, this lemma. Now we can use it to prove the, the theorem. So proof of theorem.
So in the theorem, we have to show, remember, the uh, uniform convergence that, uh, sorry, that um, uniform convergence on uh, compact sets implies that the, the infinite sum of meromorphic functions is still meromorphic. So here we will take one of the um, compact sets inside uh, U and for simplicity we take here just uh, a disk of some radius and we can uh, take this disk uh, arbitrary inside U. And now we know by the definition of uniform convergence on compact sets that there exists some N0 such that this F tilde M, which is the sum for N going to N0 to M of GN, this is a, a, is a series, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a sequence. So F tilde is a sequence of holomorphic functions on the disk, the RZ0, which is our V in the lemma, converging uniformly on V. So now we can apply the lemma. So by the lemma, um, this uh, sum going from N0 to infinity is holomorphic. Uh, so this is our F tilde is holomorphic. And what is the derivative of this function? The derivative of this function from N0 to infinity is just the sum of the um, uh, you can say this is the, the derivative of F tilde prime. And we show this is the limit as M goes to infinity of F tilde M. And this is uh, now just the zero infinity of Sorry, here I forgot prime. So it's the limit of F tilde prime of M and is the sum of G uh, N prime. Okay, so what it means is we can bring the, the derivative um, operation inside the infinite, inside the infinite uh, sum. Okay, once we know this, we are uh, ready to uh, show the theorem because now, um, if I take the sum for n going to zero to infinity of gn, I can split this sum as the sum for the first terms until n zero minus one and the sum of the other terms. So n goes from zero to infinity. And now what I know is that um, the first function here are meromorphic on K. And so also the sum will be meromorphic on K because this is a finite sum. And the last uh, function here, this is holomorphic on K. This we, we sh just uh, showed. And uh, therefore this function here is a sum of a meromorphic and holomorphic function is also meromorphic function. So is meromorphic on K. Oh, and on K in particular on the, what so was K, K was the disk, no? the, R, the RZ0. No? So we can here also replace K with the disk. The RZ0. Okay, and uh, what about the derivative? The same, for the same reason now, the derivative of this function 
is just the sum of the derivatives of the first functions plus the derivative of this uh, last function. This is just uh, because uh, uh, the sum of uh, the derivative is, uh, is the derivative of the sum for finite sums. And now we can apply what we, what we found through the lemma to show that this last function is also the infinite sum of the derivatives. And this is uh, exactly the sum of all the derivatives, now from zero to infinity. Very good, and finally, if you have now, uh, if you have now uh, Paul of the sum inside this disk, well, this must uh, be one of the poles of uh, um, Gn, but now for n going to zero to n zero minus one, because all the other function don't have, don't have um, poles in this, uh, in this disk. So now this disk was arbitrary. The uh, statement of the theorem follows. Very good, so okay. So now we have uh, uh, this theorem. So um, let me remind what the, uh, what is the theorem saying. The theorem is saying that um, if we have um, a sequence of um, 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 holomorphic uh, um, function, which is said to converge uh, uniformly on compact sets. This means that, uh, as I said in the definition, that um, the partial uh, uh, sums converges uniformly on every, on every K. And uh, um, then, we have that if this is uh, satisfied, then the infinite uh, uh, sum of these meromorphic functions is uh, function the derivative equal to the sum of the uh, derivatives. Now, the, the important question is how can we guarantee the uh, convergence, uh, which is uniform on comp comp compact sets? And here we give a criterion. for uniform convergence on compact sets, which is the Weierstrass M test adapted to this situation. So recall this M test, I think you already encountered during the, the, this course. So suppose that for all k in u, there exists some n0 and a convergent in a convergent series of positive numbers. It's called this uh, series Rn. So here n goes from n0 to infinity. So this is a convergent series. So this means that this, uh, this sum is finite. And this uh, um, has to have the property that the supremum for z in k of uh, gnz, this must be dominated by Rn. And this must solve for all n big or equal than n0. If this is true, then this sum going from zero to infinity of gn 
converges uniformly on compact sets. Okay, so here, um, uh, I say here that the series converges uniformly on compact set. And actually, this is maybe a better uh, notation than the one I used uh, uh, before. So let me then uh, change it here. So we say here that um, and let me do it like this, gn and bigger equal than zero, meromorphic on u. And then here we say sum from n going to zero to infinity gn is said to converge uniformly on complex set. Yeah, this is a uh, much uh, maybe better. So let me change it also here. Uh, so if the sum gn infinity converges for a compact set then. Okay, very good. So now we have uh, what, we, um, what we wanted. Um, we gave this uh, criterion, this is just the Weierstrass uh, criterion. And now we want to uh, apply this um, uh, theory to compute a series representation for very important functions. So we will see this gives us also beautiful uh, formulas. The first series representation, representation that we want is the series uh, representation of the function pi over sinus of pi z squared. So we want to find um, a series of meromorphic functions which is equal to this uh, meromorphic function here. So you see this meromorphic function sinus of pi z has uh, a double pole at every integer. So it's uh, natural to try to take as gn z the function one over z minus n squared, where n now is uh, uh, an arbitrary integer. So this gn is meromorphic now on C with double pole at n. And we can consider the infinite sum, consider f, which is the sum for n going to minus infinity to plus infinity of one over z minus n squared. So this you can see as uh, uh, basically two infinite series together. No? So the series from n going to minus infinity to uh, minus one, then you have one over z squared, and then you have all the other positive terms going one to infinity. So we want to show that this series converges uniformly on compact sets. We want to use the um, the M test, but before doing that, we um, we notice a very important property of this function. And let's call this property A. Namely, that the function is one periodic. So, for every z in C f of z plus one is equal to f of z. Why is that true? Because if I now take f of z plus one, this is the sum for n going to minus infinity to plus infinity of one over 
z plus 1 minus n squared. This I can rewrite as n going from minus infinity to plus infinity of 1 over z minus n minus 1 squared. And now I can just uh, make the uh, change of index m equal to n minus 1. And I will get now back f of z. This is f of z. Okay, so this shows this uh, one periodicity. So this means that we can sh uh, show uniform convergence inside a strip. So we can to show uniform convergence on the strip S, which is a strip, a uh, vertical strip of uh, width one. So we can take, for example, here, let's take the strip uh, where the real part of Z is between minus one half and one half. Okay, so let's, let's draw uh, your picture Let's put um, here the origin. Then we have here number one, number two, minus one, minus two. These are uh, the poles of the functions uh, Gn. And then my, my strip S will be this infinite strip here. So this is the strip. A strip S. And so here you see if you have, uh, for example, a point Z here, then you have all the, you have all the points Z plus one, and here uh, Z plus two, and here Z uh, minus one, Z minus two. So this, uh, since the function F is periodic, it's enough to show the convergence only in, uh, in the strip uh, S because all the other points can be brought inside this strip by making a, a suitable uh, translation. Very good. So um, now we want to show the convergence on this, uh, on this strip. So we want to find this uh, N0 and this ma ma majorant sequence. This is the, what the M-test is. So we see that uh, among all the functions Gn, only the function one over Z has a pole inside S. So we can just take as N0 now uh, zero. So take N0, sorry, uh, equal to one. So we want just to discard uh, uh, n equal to zero. And now we can uh, just take all the n's such that the norm is bigger or equal than one. So we're just discarding n equal uh, to zero. No? So remember the function f actually is made of two series, but we want to treat these two series uh, at the same time. So we just take norm of n bigger or equal than one. So we are just discarding the term one over z squared. For the other terms, now we want to, have to get uh, um, an estimate. So if n is then uh, normal bigger or equal than one and z is in the strip s, then I want to get an estimate on g n z the norm, so this is one over the norm of z minus n squared. Now my, my number z will have some real part x and um, imaginary part uh, y. So this is then x minus n squared plus y squared, where here we are taking z equal to x plus i y. 
um, very good. So this is the the norm. And now uh, you see x minus n will always be um, at least uh, at least norm of n minus one half squared uh, because the uh, x is uh, in um, as the norm which, which is between uh, um, zero and one half so norm of x is less or equal than one half therefore norm of uh, x minus n is um, bigger or equal than norm of n minus one half then plus one half squared. Now, so here we used that uh, x minus n is actually in norm bigger than n minus norm of x, and this is bigger or equal than norm of n minus one half. Okay, so now that we have this um, inequality, we can go uh, one step. Uh, further and say that we can also get rid of, of uh, y. So this is less or equal than Rn, which is one over norm of n minus one half squared. And now this Rn is a convergent sequence, uh, uh, gives rise, to, sorry, to a convergent uh, series. And the sum for n norm of n from one to infinity of Rn. Oh, sorry, here I put R um, norm of n. This is uh, finite. And this is essentially because here you see we have the exponent two. Now, so you know that when you um, sum the one over k to the power alpha and the, when alpha is uh, bigger than one then the series uh, will be convergent okay so in this case we have alpha equal to two so the series is convergent so by the m test we get that um, the series gn converges uniformly on compact sets on S. And then by the periodicity uh, on the whole C. So by periodicity, by property A, uh, also on C. Very good. So now we know what we know we have found property B. Oh, let me see what this property B is. So we know that F is meromorphic on C because we used, uh, we used the theorem. Now we know the series converges uniformly on compact sets. And what are the poles of F? The poles of F are exactly the integers because this GN have poles at n and all the poles are distinct. And what is the principal part of F at the pole? Is given, given exactly by Z minus n squared. Because for, um, for the other integers, um, we get uh, that the other functions don't have a pole at n. So this is the principal part of f at z equal to n. Very good. So this is uh, now a meromorphic function f. We know also the principal part. And um, we want now to show um, last property, which will be important. To state this property, we want to take now a subset of the strip. So for all k bigger than zero, so small k bigger than zero, we take the part of the strip 
which has a um, big uh, imaginary part. So Z in C, such that the real part of Z is less or equal than one half, so we are in the strip S, but we require also that the imaginary part of Z is bigger or equal than K. So this means that here we are taking uh, K and here below also we are taking minus K and then we are considering this part here outside. So this, this part here is uh, uh, S, K, S, K. So what we want to, to show now is, is that basically the function F converges to zero on the strip when Z goes to infinity. And to, to say this in a more precise term, we introduce these strips S, K. What we want to show now is this property C. Namely that the supremum of F of Z for Z in this strip converges to zero when K goes to infinity. And this has exactly this um, intuitive uh, meaning of the function f having limit zero when z goes to zero and is also inside the strip. Now, so if we take now um, sequence of points inside the strip going to infinity, then the limit will be zero. And actually this limit will be uh, uniform you know, in the sense that when k goes to infinity, then uh, the supremum uh, of the norm of F goes to zero uniformly uh, for all Z in uh, SK. So let me show this uh, property. So proof. To show this property, we go back to the inequalities we saw here. And now starting with this inequality, we want to make use also of uh, y. So remember y is the imaginary part of z, so now also y will play uh, a role. So if now z is in sk, then the norm of g and z, you, you know this is less or equal than 1 over x minus n, or it was more precisely at the end, uh, norm of n minus 1 half, squared plus y squared. So this here um, we know. And now we have basically two uh, possibilities. So one possibility is to, to just take uh, less or equal than y squared, which we know this is less or equal than one over k squared. And uh, this we, we take if norm of n is, uh, is uh, small with respect to k. So when, when k um, is big with respect to uh, norm of n. In the other case, uh, sorry, this we take, um, this we take when, uh, right, when norm of n is uh, small with respect to k. In the other case, so if the norm of n is bigger or equal than k, then um, what we do, we take instead the other, the other term. And um, uh, right, so we have these two uh, estimates. So why we want to, uh, to do this because now we want to estimate the, um, the norm of f of z, which is the sum of all, um, of all these terms. So this is the sum for norm of n less than, than k. Plus the sum for norm of n bigger or equal than k.
so in the in the first case, so you, you see we can uh, use the first uh, the first estimate here. This is sum for norm of n less than k of one over k squared. And in the second one, you get sum for norm of n bigger or equal than k, one over norm of n minus one half squared. And the first, uh, the first sum here, we are summing always the same, the same number, one over k squared. So remember the sum is uh, over uh, n. So uh, how many of these terms do we have? So norm of n less than k means that n goes from minus k to plus k. And these are exactly 2k plus one. Uh, sorry, if norm of n is less than k, this means that, that n goes from minus k plus one to k minus one. And these are exactly 2k minus one numbers. So you have here 2k minus one numbers times one over k squared. And this goes to zero as k goes to infinity because we are dividing by k squared, but at the numerator, we have just a linear term in k. So this goes to zero. And also this other term here goes to zero. This sum as k goes to infinity. Um, this goes to zero because the sum for norm of n now from one to infinity, we know that this is, that this is finite. So one, when you know that you have a convergent series of positive numbers, this means that if you start now from uh, a number k, the sum and you go up, then uh, when k goes to infinity, then the, the reminder, so all these sums with, uh, with index bigger or equal than k will go to uh, zero. Now this is a, a general fact of uh, a convergent series. So if the series is convergent, if I start now from an arbitrary high number, I will get um, a sum which tends to zero as this number goes to uh, infinity. Very good. So, this shows uh, then uh, property C. And now we are almost ready to prove our theorem. So the theorem we want to prove is that the function pi over sinus of pi z squared, this function is actually equal to this uh, infinite sum. So n from minus infinity to plus infinity, one over z minus n squared. So to prove the theorem, we also need a, a short lemma. And the lemma basically says that also the function which we have here on the left, the function hz equal to pi over sinus of pi z squared, also this function satisfies the three properties above. property A, B, and C. Then when, when once we know this, we will see in the theorem, in the proof of the theorem that uh, these properties A, B, and C determine a function uniquely. So there cannot be two functions with these uh, three properties, different functions with these three properties. So this will show that um, uh, we have uh, uh, the theorem, the statement of the theorem. So let me show first that, uh, uh, that the lemma holds. So the, uh, the proof of property A, you can check it very easily. Property A, uh, you can check it. I will not do it here. And let's do uh, B. Now let's do property B. And we start by doing for n equal uh, to zero. So recall um, 
property B says that uh, the function H has uh, a pole of order two at all integers with, um, with uh, um, principal part equal to one over Z minus N squared. So let's see uh, this property for uh, N equal to zero. So what we have to do, we have to show that um, principal part of hz at z equal to zero is one over z squared. So this is what we have to show. And this is actually uh, also uh, something you, you saw more or less already in the exercises. So we use here the uh, small o notation. So first of all, we start by recalling the Taylor series expansion of the sinus uh, function. So this is pi z minus pi cube z cube over six plus higher order terms. And now using this expansion, you can take uh, the square. And also here, uh, you should check that this gives you pi squared z squared one minus pi z over three plus O of uh, z. So this is sine squared. So if you take the, uh, this expansion for the sinus function, you, you square it and you um, take care of the small o's, then you see that you get exactly what we have here on the right, but please uh, do it on your own. And uh, this implies now that if I take pi squared over sinus squared of pi z, then um, you see uh, you get pi squared over pi squared z squared, and here you have one plus pi z over three plus o of z, which is exactly what we wanted. One over z squared uh, plus, okay, so here I see, I uh, think I made a small, a small mistake because here there was, this was a squared. Yes, yeah, so this was a squared here above. So you really should do the computation on your own. Don't trust me. Um, very good. So here you get this. And so you get here pi squared over three and then higher order terms. Okay, so you see here the, uh, the principal part is one over z squared. Then this, is, this was for z equal to zero. Uh, for the others, you just can use the periodicity. Property B for n different from zero, just uh, use uh, property, property A. Also, since F is one periodic, then also the, you can just uh, shift uh, the, um, you can just shift the principal parts. Okay, so if you want now to find the principal part at n, you just have to shift the principal part one over z squared of n, and this is exactly one over z minus n squared. Okay, so this is property uh, B, property follows just by uh, using the definition of uh, the sinus function. So this is um, one over two i e to the uh, i z minus e to the minus i z. The norm, and now remember z, we can write it as uh, x plus i y. So this is one half in here norm of e to the i and here I forgot uh, pi, so i pi z 
i pi z. So e pi x and then uh, times e to the minus i pi y minus e to the minus i pi x times e, sorry here it's not no i, minus pi y e pi y. Okay, very good. So here now you, uh, you see this number, this number have norm one. So you can just, you can just say this is less or equal than uh, one half e to the minus pi y minus e um, sorry, bigger or equal. So I want to show that, uh, yes, I want to show that this goes to uh, infinity. No? So then this is bigger or equal than this e to the pi y. And this is when y is less than zero. You know that the first part is bigger than the second part. And then uh, for y, bigger than zero, then you do the other way around. So e to the pi y minus e minus pi y. And you see that in both cases, this uh, goes to <clears throat> infinity when the norm of y goes to infinity. So the sinus goes to infinity, then uh, um, this means that pi over sinus of pi z squared goes to zero as y goes to infinity. Uh, so um, this is exactly property C. So we said property C means that uh, when the, the imaginary part goes to infinity, we want the function to go to zero uniformly. And here, um, you see that uh, this is exactly uh, the case. Okay, so this is property C and then we have the end of the lemma. And now we can prove uh, the theorem. So proof of theorem. So for the proof of the theorem, we want to show that uh, uh, F is equal to H. So we take now the difference. So take G of Z, which is f of z minus h of z. So remember f was this infinite series and h is uh, pi over sinus of pi z squared. So now g has property a and uh, c because these properties are in some sense uh, properties that uh, are possessed by f and h, and then also a difference will have this property because f and h have these properties. You can see then if f and h have these properties, then also the difference have the same property. Then since f and h have property b, so this tells me that they have, uh, uh, F and H have a pole at every integer with uh, um, principal part equal to one over Z minus N squared. Then F minus H is holomorphic on C. Now because only poles of G can be at the integers at uh, um, the integers uh, set equal to N, but um, F and H have same principal part 
at uh, z equal to n. Uh, so this means that if I want to write the uh, Lorentz series expansion at z equal to n, what I will have, uh, I will have the Lorentz series expansion of f, this z minus n squared plus terms of order bigger than zero. And then we have here minus the same thing for f, for h. So the, these two, the, these two principal parts then they go away and you, you remain with O of one now for z uh, equal to n. And uh, this shows you that uh, G has a re re removable singularity at z equal to n, so the, the function can be extended as a holomorphic function, the whole C. So we showed that G is holomorphic on C. Now we want to show that G is a bounded function on C. So G is also bounded on C. Why is that so? So because G is bounded on the strip S. So indeed, G is bounded on S because G is holomorphic there and the limit as G uh, of G of Z, as, G, as Z go to infinity and is inside the strip is equal to zero. So at infinity, the function has a finite limit. This means that the function now must be uh, globally uh, bounded on the, the strip. Then G bounded on S means also G bounded on C, on C because we have property A. From property A, G is also bounded on C. Very good, so now G is bounded on C, is holomorphic on C, by Liouville's theorem, G is constant, so Liouville implies G is constant. And we can maybe call already this constant equal to C. So G of Z equal to C is constant. What is this constant? Well, this constant must be zero because the limit for Z going to infinity, Z in the strip is zero. So um, C equal to zero since uh, since uh, zero is the limit for z going to infinity z equal to s of g of z, but g of z is constant, so is also the limit of c, so this implies that c is equal to zero. So g is, uh, um, so this implies that g of g is equal to zero at all points, and this is uh, if and only if um, f of z is equal to h of z, short of z, which is exactly what we wanted uh, to show. So this uh, finishes the proof of the theorem. Okay, so this was a long uh, journey, but we have, uh, uh, for example, as a corollary of the theorem, the following nice corollary is that the if we take the sum from one to infinity of one over n squared, this is pi squared over six. So this was a formula that was found first by uh, Euler and you can uh, prove it as a, uh, an exercise in the worksheet. And the idea is that uh, you just have to, um, you just have to take the limit for z going to zero of, uh, um, 
of the uh, regular part of uh, F and H. Oh, this, is, this is the idea, but you will see it in the, in the worksheet. Okay, very good. So this was a um, um, long theorem, but now uh, knowing this theorem, we can in some sense find more easily other representations. And this is what we want to uh, do next. So now it's representation. Uh, of uh, the cotangent function of pi z. What is the, um, why do we want to do this in this case? Because you have uh, uh, that the cotangent, or better pi times the cotangent, is uh, the antiderivative of minus pi over sinus of pi z squared. So you see the function we already computed as a series has as antiderivative pi times cotangent of pi z. So let me uh, write here what we found before. Thanks to the, the theorem above, this is the sum of minus one over z minus n squared. And now what we want to do is we want to take now the antiderivative here inside the sum. And uh, this can be uh, then easily done. This is the derivative here of one over z minus And now what we uh, would like to do is to say, okay, then I can take the derivative outside. No, but we would see this uh, doesn't work as expected. And we get this, uh, this information. And then what we want to do now is to show that the function here inside is actually uh, is actually equal to pi times the cotangent of pi z. Okay, but here there is uh, there is a problem because this function here does not converges, this series here does not converge uniformly on compact sets because this here actually is not even uh, convergent. Is not convergent. No? Uh, and the, the idea here because not convergent is that uh, uh, because this time we have to take the sum over one over n and going from one to infinity and this is now divergent. Also rec recall before we had uh, a squared at the denominator, now we don't have it anymore and this um, gives us some problems. So what we have to do now, we have to, to change this function here by uh, adding uh, some uh, constants that make everything, uh, um, everything work. And it will, we will see um, that uh, this can be actually uh, done. In, in fact, we will uh, uh, define the following series. So before of that, so this shows here um, this equality is not is not correct. Okay, so we cannot go uh, uh, this way. We see how uh, 
to um, uh, fix this problem. So to fix this problem, consider F1 of Z, which is uh, one over Z plus the sum for N different from zero. So N is uh, an integer different from zero of one over Z minus N plus one over N. So what we are doing here is that except for N equal to zero, we are summing this uh, constant here. And this does not change the derivative because we are summing a constant, but we will see that it will change the convergence of the series. So this new series actually will be convergent. And this is given by the following theorem. So the series F1 converges uniformly on compact sets in uh, in C. And we also have the desired formula. So pi cotangent of pi z is equal to F1 of z. And also you can rewrite this F1 of z in a, in a slightly different way. One over z plus the sum from n going from one to infinity of 2z divided by z squared minus n squared. And this holds for all z. Okay, so let us prove uh, this theorem. So to, to show the, uh, the convergence, um, what, we have to, uh, what we have to do, so we have to uh, define gn z minus n plus one over n. This is the, uh, the sequence. And you see now, if I do this sum, I get here n times z minus n. And above, I get n plus z minus n. And so this is z uh, over n times z minus n. So now, um, for norm of n bigger or equal than n zero, which is uh, one in this case, or better uh, still uh, not, maybe not one, but we will take, uh, well, let me do this uh, difference. So for, let's take, first take, take, what we have to do. So take first dk zero for some uh, k bigger or equal than one. Um, and consider n zero, which is given by 2k and take a z in dk zero bar. Then what happens? So now we can estimate this g, uh, gn at z. So gn at z, this is uh, equal to norm of z divided by n, norm of n times Uh, times norm of uh, z minus n. And here what we are doing, what we are taking, um, we are taking n bigger or equal than n zero. Then for n bigger or equal than n zero, now what happens? Uh, this is less or equal than norm of z is less or equal than two than k then we have here norm of n. 
what is now norm of z minus n, how can I estimate it? So this I can estimate by norm of n minus norm of z. And you see norm of z is less or equal than k. So this is also less or equal than k divided by norm of n times norm of n minus k. But now um, n is bigger, sorry, norm of n is bigger or equal than n zero. And this implies that uh, that norm, uh, sorry, that k is less or equal than norm of n divided by two. So this is k, here we have norm of n, norm of n minus norm of n divided by two. Uh, so because here, we are using that uh, k is less or equal than norm of n divided by two. Also norm of, do it more precisely, k is less or equal than, sorry, k is equal to n zero divided by two and this is less or equal than norm of n divided by two. Okay, so now you see here we get, um, k over norm of n times norm of n divided by two, and this is 2k norm of n squared. And this now, this is this Rn, and this is a convergent now uh, series. Then sum of Rn for n and zero to infinity is convergent. So by the M test, sum of Gn is uh, converges uniformly, formally on compact sets. So we know now that um, this, uh, this, this is the sum, this is F1. So F1 is a meromorphic, meromorphic uh, function. And the other thing we know is that the, the derivative of this F prime is now is the sum of all uh, of all the derivatives so what 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 were the um, uh, these uh, derivatives so here we had um, for n different from zero we get exactly the derivative of one over z minus n plus one over n. And for z equal to zero, we had the derivative of one over z. And so you see as um, before that this is the sum for n different from zero and in z of minus one over z minus n squared. And then we get here minus one over z squared. And we saw before this is the derivative of pi times the cotangent of pi z. So this means that uh, f1 minus pi the cotangent of pi z has zero derivative. So uh, um, this is then a constant F1 <clears throat> uh, on Z is equal to pi cotangent of pi Z plus a constant C. So how do we determine this constant? So to determine this constant, we argue as follows. So observe, uh, so we, sh we show now 
that c is equal to zero. And also what we, with what we have to show that this equality here holds. Also, this also we have to show, we have to show. So let's show first this second uh, statement. So uh, observe that if I now take uh, G N Z plus G minus N Z, what is this? This is one over Z minus N plus one over N plus one over Z minus minus N plus one over minus N. So this, uh, these two terms here go away and <clears throat> What we are left is um, z squared minus n squared and above to z. If you do the computation. So this implies exactly that f1 of z, this is equal to one over z plus the sum for n going from one to infinity of gn z plus g minus n z and this is one over z plus sum for n going from one to infinity of two z divided by z squared minus n squared. Okay, so this is, ex this is exactly the, the equation we have to, to find. But now from this, we also see that f1 is an odd function. So then f1 is odd because f1 of minus z is one over minus z plus sum from n going from one to infinity of two times minus z over minus z squared minus n squared. And this is minus f1 of z. So since the cotangent also is odd, is also odd, the function f1 minus pi, which is a constant, is odd. And the only way a, a, a constant function can be odd is that the constant is zero. Okay, and this uh, finishes the proof of, um, of this theorem. So we also found an expansion for the cotangent. And also this expansion has some nice uh, formula attached to it. So we can show using this, uh, this uh, theorem that the sum of four n squared minus one, when n goes from one to infinity, is equal to four minus pi divided by eight. And this is also an exercise for you. Okay, very good. So I want to end uh, this lecture with one last example, which we'll come back also in the next one. And this is the Riemann zeta function. So this function is very important in number theory, and you might have heard of the Riemann's hypothesis as uh, one big conjecture in mathematics. It's a hypothesis about the function we are about to define. So in this case, we want to take as gn, this is a um, holomorphic function in C for n bigger or equal than one, which is defined as one over n to the z. And uh, um, you know that when you take uh, a number to the z power, and that is a complex number, this is usually not uh, a unique number. But in this case, since n is a positive real number, we can just take the principal branch of the logarithm to define this number. So this is a well-defined uh, number. And you see this is uh, holomorphic. 
function. So it's e to the z times the logarithm of, um, uh, of n. And also maybe you can also derive like this is even clearer that this is a holomorphic function. Okay, now we want to consider the uh, series of these holomorphic functions. And we want to show this uh, convergence uniform on compact sets. This will not happen everywhere. For this, we have to restrict uh, Z. So what we have to do now, we have to take A is a number bigger than one. And we take Z in C such that the real part of Z is bigger or equal than A. Then for this number, we get a nice estimate. So then GNZ in norm, <clears throat> what is it? This is equal to one over the norm of E log N times Z. And this is one over E log N uh, times the real part of Z. And now you, you can use back the definition of the logarithm to get one over n to the real part of z. And this now you know, since we put this uh, condition on the real part, that this is less or equal than one over n to the a. This is my sequence rn, and then sum of rn from n going to one to infinity is less than plus infinity because A is bigger than one. So what we found, so hence, what we found is that this function Z zeta of Z, this is the sum for N going from one to infinity, one over N to Z, converges uniformly on compact sets to a holomorphic function Z on <clears throat> which set? So the set which is uh, the union of all the all the points with uh, real part bigger or equal than A for any A bigger than one. So this means simply that the real part of Z must be bigger than one. And because this is, this set here is just the union <clears throat> for all the A bigger than one of Z in C such that the real part of Z is bigger or equal than A. And this function here is called, called uh, Riemann zeta function. Zeta function. So observe maybe just two properties. So we have that zeta of two is equal to the sum or n equal to one to infinity of one over n squared. And this we computed it is pi squared over six. And also what happens when z goes to one? Well, the function here uh, goes to infinity. So when z goes to one and the real part of z uh, is uh, bigger than one, zeta of z goes to infinity. And this is, again, because the harmonic series diverges. Okay, so we will meet again this uh, function in the next uh, lecture where we are going to discuss infinite uh, products. So thanks for the attention.